Good morning. Happy Thanksgiving week. Chapter 4 in Ecclesiastes 1 through 14. Ecclesiastes 4 through thir- uh, 1 through 14. So I returned and considered all the oppressions that are done under the sun, and behold, the tears of such as were oppressed, and they had no comforter. And on the side of their oppressors there was power, but they had no comforter. Wherefore I praise the dead which are already dead more than the living which are yet alive. Yea, better is he than both they which hath not yet been, who hath not seen the evil work that is done under the sun. Again, I considered all travail and every right work, that for this a man is envied of his neighbor. This is also vanity and vexation of spirit. The fool folds his hands together and eats his own flesh. Better is a handful with quietness than both the hands full with travail and vexation of the spirit. Then I returned, and I saw vanity under the sun. There is one alone, and there is not a second. Yeah, he hath neither child nor brother. Yet is there no end of all his labor, neither is his eye satisfied with riches, neither saith he, for whom I do I labor, and bereave my soul of good. This is also vanity, yes, it is a sore travail. Two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow, but woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat, but how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Better is a poor and a wise child than an old and foolish king, who will no more be admonished. For out of prison he cometh to reign, whereas also he that is born in his kingdom becomes poor. Amen. Let's look to the Lord in prayer this morning and ask a new Heavenly Father by means of your Holy Spirit to be the one that preaches this sermon today. It's, it's very, very critical, very important in the times and the day in which we live. And that through it there be a stronger binding unity of spirit. There would be the, that strong cord of threefold cord that is not quickly broken amongst the believers in our church today, not only here, but even in uh, our United States. We thank you that you, once again, are going to be able to preach from the day of Solomon and preach the same message today in our 21st century because all the Word of God is relevant to every time and era that we live. And might we just uh, rejoice in that, glean the truth from uh, your words today to teach us, instruct us, and direct our steps. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I started at verse 1 and and moved forward because, as I said earlier, he he establishes a a picture of of what is happening there in his day and then the lesson that he wants to give to the people. One of the questions we have to ask when we read a text of Scripture is what is the original intent of the writer? So with Solomon, what was his intention? By way of introduction, that's, that is important for us because in order to make sense out of the passage. Well, long before there were surveys and analytical studies, there was, and there still is, the, the word, the wisdom of the scripture. So Solomon is known uh, by most scholars, and the Hebrew would uh, teach us that he was known as the teacher. And so the teacher says, and I've illustrated before, he kind of is writing to the younger generation, the up and coming generation of his day. And so as he would teach these young people and, and his audience and all of his writings, he taught from observation, the things that he observed, the common events and the, the settings of his day. Chapter five, for example, deals with the subject of worship. He would see people coming in out of the temple. Here's our, there are several passages in the book that speaks on the subject of government. He makes observations of political corruption and of wise men, of warfare and injustice. There's politics, agriculture, shipping, and uh, the matter of, uh, of uh, investment of money. All of these things Solomon observed, and then he would write, and, and, and as Jesus would teach parables, Solomon would teach lessons from his observations. 
And oftentimes we have this reoccurring phrase, and then I saw. This was a common phrase. And so in chapter 4, he observes, I returned and I considered all the oppressed. And then from there on up through verse 14, Solomon is going to be talking about uh, the, the subject of loneliness, the subject of emptiness. And he's addressing it to a people that you would think it really wouldn't matter, but he foresaw that there were situations at time where people would choose to be by themselves in a culture and in a uh, time and place when there were no other forms of communication other than verbal or oral. Very little writing was done at that time as we know it today. And obviously there were not the benefits of the uh, internet. So when Solomon would write, his illustrations and his lesson would be based upon true events, things that actually happen. And what this would do, this would allow the people to connect to his story. It was just as Jesus in his day would, would use parables. And he would talk about the treasure, hidden, the hidden treasure in a field. Or he would talk about the, the, the sower of the grain in the field and the birds of the air, of the little children that he would bring. He used all of these things to tell stories and to teach lessons. And the people could connect by virtue of what they saw or the things that they were very familiar with. And so the application would come shortly after his illustrative story. Here we have today in chapter 4, he deals on this subject of people that are by themselves and uh, the problems that arise out of that. So he, he starts out with three illustrations. The first in verses 1 to 3 is the, the loneliness of those that are oppressed. And you, the, uh, the key word, you look for repetitive words. And here we find, I saw one, uh, no one or one alone, and no comforter, verses 1 to 3. Such that were under, uh, that were oppressed, they had no comforter. And aside of their oppressors, there was power, but they had no comfort. So they, here are a people that there is no one there to encourage, to strengthen them. His second illustration moves, then when we get to verse, uh, verses 4 to 6, of the selfish laborer. This is a man that... Um, he, he builds, he works, he's very uh, intelligent. Again, I considered all travail and every work, right work, that there is a man envied of his neighbor, and he says this also in his vanity and vexation of spirit. Here is a man that is, he, this fool folds his hands together and he eats of his own flesh. The implied leaning is he is so self-centered He's very good at what he does. His, en his neighbor envies him, but he's consumed with himself. He's consumed with his own work, but he's still alone. That's the main point. And then he takes us to verses 7 and 8, the, the illustration of a, uh, another selfish laborer. And then I returned and I saw vanity under the sun. There is one alone. And it is not a second. Yea, he is not a child nor a brother, and there is no end of all his labor, neither is his eye satisfied with riches, neither saith he, for whom do I labor and breathe my soul this good. He doesn't even consider what he's going to do in the distribution of his goods. So his lesson out of the selfish labor, he illustrates it by a common setting, somebody that lost family. But yet this man is that's not his issue. His issue is he labors and he keeps, but he doesn't have anybody to share it with. It is loneliness. He's isolated himself from society, so he doesn't even raise the question, where am I going to, how am I going to give out my goods? Then he gets to the heart of this, and he, he brings all of this together in verses uh, 9 to 14. So actually, we would begin it at, in verse 8 with the idea of one alone, and then verse 9 transitions into two are better than one. After we've witnessed uh, the, the isolated ones in oppression, we've witnessed the individual that labors for himself and is all consumed by himself. He has no family in which to share out his goods. He doesn't raise the question. Solomon says, now I want to give you three themes. And it begins with the idea that two are better than one. What he has to say here for us today is just as important now as it was then. Because what Solomon is doing, he's drawing from 
uh, the common knowledge of experience and different scenes and settings, real life events. And out of those real life events, he wants to make a very important application. He's talking about real people. He's talking about real label, genuine friends. There are known accidents that we'll read about in our text. There is the, the subject of uneven terrain. There is cold weather. All of these things, the people, as they would listen to him, we understand it. We, we get it. We might even say uh, that there's kind of a similarity there that when John the Baptist was preaching, he would talk about when Jesus comes and, and the judgment that was coming, that the, the grain would be separated from the chaff that would be thrown into an unquenchable fire. And that vivid imagery of the, the dust and the loose chaff off of the grain was highly flammable, and there was no way that you could put it out. That's why it was called an unquenchable fire. A story, a picture, to drive home a point. And Solomon is teaching us that in his day, the problem of being alone, not having friends, people that chose not to have friends, or they did not have the right friends, is just as important because we could take the text, we could drop it right dead smack in the middle of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and there in chapter 12 of, of that book, we learn the importance of body language within the church. We are intimately and uh, divinely connected one to another just as the human body. So Paul uses the human body and its sensitivity of the hurts and the ailments of, of our extremities and the core parts of our body that when one member hurts, the rest suffers with it. And Solomon writes the same way, that when a friend is, a, when someone is by himself, there is the need of some friendship, some bond of unity, somebody there to help bring it together. So Solomon would take literal events just as Paul would take literal events and associate the church with that of the, uh, the human body so that people would understand how closely connected we are to each other. If this were a, uh, an article that were written, we might describe it as this, a biblical worldview of friendship in the 21st century, because that's what the whole subject is about. Having the right biblical view on the meaning of friends and friendship and the, th the three themes that Solomon gives to us. And that's, I'm going to give you these three themes here this morning. Number one is isolation is not good for anybody. I, even though some prefer that, some would love to say, I just want to go to a mountaintop, spend the rest of my life there, and have nobody bother me. Well, that sounds good, and it may have a, sense, a certain amount of appeal to it, but it's not good. It's not right. It militates against so many passages of Scripture that we dare not even entertain the idea as being a good idea. Secondly, the duty of friendship. So the first is found in verse 1, the isolation is not good for anybody. And then in the verses that follow, the major theme is the duty of friendship. What are our obligations to one another? And the third is there is a prevailing strength of friendship that is not available to one that is by himself. So there comes this uh, phrase, there is strength in numbers, and all the teacher is giving us today is to say, there's strength in two. Now this has application in a variety of ways, in our associations with one another. It's not that you just choose one person to be your friend, you can have a multitude of friends. But in particular, we would say that it has a tremendous amount of meaning and impact when it comes to the subject of marriage, which we witnessed here last Saturday, where two, we become together because now there is a prevailing strength that exists when two hearts are united together. One can lift the other one up. One can help uh, maintain spiritual integrity and so forth. So let's take a look at these three themes because the, the chapter itself doesn't necessarily lend itself to an easy outline, but rather you can draw the outline from the three major thoughts that are presented to us. Let's take a look at the first one, that isolation is not good for anybody. I said that there are a multitude of passages that would teach against that. That started in the book of Genesis. Way back in the book of Genesis, as God was uh, putting all of the creation together and he maintains and he continually repeat at the end of each one of those days, he'd say it was good. And then when he creates Adam and Eve and he puts Adam out there, Adam is given the task of assigning uh, names to all the animals and to find a helpmeet that was suitable for him. And he comes to the discovery by Adam 
It's not like God said, well, I didn't think about that one, but rather Adam reveals a universal truth, and that is he could find, not find, anything of in the creation that was a suitable help me to him. There was no one there that would serve as a companion in the animal kingdom. So God used these words. The only time in the creation story that you find it, it is not good for man to be alone. It is not good, and it sets precedent. It doesn't, it has, its initial implication is that in terms of celibacy or a, a becoming a, a maid and living that way for your, uh, yourself by choice all your life, it is not in your best interest. Now, there are, we understand that there are some occasions when God calls people out for that life of celibacy and purity. And Jesus speaks to that. But the general theme, idea is, it's not good for an individual to be by himself. Why not? Well, number one, it violates the greatest commandment of the Scripture. When the lawyer asked Jesus, uh, what, are, what are the greatest commandments? Jesus said this, love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and your neighbor as yourself. So the exercise of love towards your neighbor is violated if we choose an isolated life. Like, I don't have anything to do with anybody. I have my connections. I have my associations. I have my workplace relationships, whatever it might be. But when it comes to the kind of friend that Solomon is teaching to us here, that you do not have. And so we are not able to love our neighbor. We're not able to satisfy Galatians 6, 4, whereby we are called, bear one another's burdens. That's what friends do. And so fulfill the law of Christ. But an individual who chooses to live by himself misses out on one of the greatest blessings. It's more blessed to give than it is to receive. Secondly, we would also observe, or number three, we would observe that it's a great a disadvantage during times of temptation. And in a world in which we live today, the many avenues in which our enemy, our adversary can enter in and, and bring about corruption, we would find from our text this morning that uh, woe is him who is alone. He has not another to help him up. It's the woe of when you face a trial, when you face a struggle, when you face a temptation. That is the other benefit that of having an individual, a friend, to be able to help fight off and help you work through that temptation in your life. You see, it's not a matter of, uh, of uh, if it'll ever happen. It's a matter of when will we face a temptation. And so it's the, the woe that is given to us in there that if an individual is left to himself, woe well unto him that is, is alone. It is because there is no companionship. It's because there is no comfort. There is no protection from another. There is no direction in his life. There is no outside wisdom that is available to him. Now, does this really matter in our society today? I read some several articles this week, and just in, in general reading in particular, uh, as I noticed the article, I thought how fitting it is for this passage. And in this, it was a survey of taken of, of uh, over 20,000 individuals in a cross-section of the United States. And it was done by uh, Cigna, the, a huge conglomerate of, of health insurance companies. And what they were looking at was on the subject of, of mental health. And in that survey, what they discovered was that 43.5% of the people surveyed in 22 questions would classify themselves as being lonely. They connected this then with another survey of the areas of dementia and Alzheimer's disease, and they made, they recognized there was a correlation between loneliness and that of um, dementia and leading to Alzheimer's. And the, the whole idea, and this, by the way, is a, these results came out in May of 2018. So this is very recent. These results are very recent. And the whole idea of the study was to find out what is, the, what is happening uh, with people. Why do people end up with dementia? And they, in that, they found out because of the, of the, the situation of loneliness. 
And so out of uh, Florida State University, they did another survey, and in that, they wanted to find out what qualifies as being lonely. And in the qualifications of loneliness, it, it's not always the fact that you, you don't have friends. There were people that had a multitude of close relationships, but they felt lonely. And then there were those that pretty much looked like you should be a lonely individual, but they had two or three people that they were closely connected with, and they were not lonely. So it didn't matter how many people, but rather what really matters was the depth of the relationship is what decided the felt lonely. And that was the operative word. These people would feel lonely. And it's hard to imagine how people could feel lonely in such a crowded society. How could people be, have a sense of loneliness in, uh, when we talk about the social networking that we have today? As I pointed out to the young people in our chapel on Wednesday, I said, when, anything, when I make statements about social media, I want you to understand, I'm not slamming it, but I am saying this. We have to be careful, and we have to be alert. As Christians, is there actually, uh, are there uh, warnings, are there things that we have to be careful of, as well as the advantages? And the answer to that is yes. So in this uh, very, very uh, well-written survey that would take place, of the 43.5% of the people in the United States, of our 20,000 candidates who did the questionnaire, 45% of those were uh, heavily invested in social networking. Now, what's that tell you? So, of of the, let's just say, let's just make it 50-50. 50% of the people in the United States maintain a sense of loneliness. Of that group, over half of those also said, we are heavily invested in social networking. My network of friends is all there in Facebook and Twitter and any other social media. They're still suffering loneliness. What is the issue that arises there? It's because it creates a thin sense of friendship. And now I made a big deal of the beginning of this, of these original characters and these visible lessons that people were familiar with. And it was a hands-on. It was situations where people could see it, smell it, hear it, touch it. They understood cold weather. They understood rough terrain. But when you get into the levels of friendship, on in that of social media, as informative as it might be, it lacks depth. It lacks a three-dimensional quality of fullness that we look for, that we hunger for, because God created us to be social beings. We were created so that we would interact and help and support one another. And so when we look at its isolation is not good, We have to consider into consideration what are some of the practices that we do that lend itself into a false sense of friendship that really becomes a matter of being excluded or secluding or limiting our friends. It has many advantages, and it does, it is the most effective means of communication. It saves time. And if anything else, it makes more time available to do something else, another task, and it increases availability. So when I go from this building to that building, I can conduct the conversation that I normally, with it were just a telephone, I'd have to sit at the desk and do, but I can only even have to use my thumbs anymore. I could speak to my phone and I can send a text. So I'm able to save time and do two things all at the same time. That's called the ability to multitask, and I'm limited, very, very limited on multitasking. So I am subject to tripping over the tree root on the way out, but that's another story by itself. But when we talk about social media, those are the benefits, but there are some disadvantages. Let me give you a couple. You see, it can militate against the two are better than one. You see, friendships become thin and shallow. At any point in time, you can be unfriended. Secondly, friendships are very selective. You choose who you want to be as your friend, or you 
do not choose. And we look at the scripture in the context of the church, we are not allowed that liberty. We have an obligation to seek out and to find and to help and to encourage and to strengthen. Thirdly, friendships lack a three-dimensional quality. By that, I mean there, there's something missing if you cannot look an individual in the eye. You cannot hear their voice. You cannot hear sorrow in a text. You cannot hear sorrow in an email. There's no warmth unless you have a multitude and a very good vocabulary to express warmth from your heart. Paul was able to do that. In fact, in the Hebrew and the Greek, the, the bowels of mercy was an expression of the deepest feelings of an individual. And so that is how they communicated the intensity of feeling toward one another. But I doubt if we use that word today. And, and then our choice words sometimes are are so uh, redefined and watered down that they just lack the strength, like I love you, or I, we, we really care, or maybe more popular is the fact that we are praying for you, and what do we do? We send emoji symbols. And you know they're, they're good because we can do that from here to there, but there's nothing better than actually being there and praying with somebody on a subject about their health or what have you. In other words, the three-dimensional world is the way God designed us. The social media world is good for forms of communication to send a message and an explanation, but it lacks the sight, the hearing, the ability to smell. It, it, it lacks all of the features of how God created us. And so it's very important. There's a, there's a fourth one that uh, I just, in my reading I discovered this. This came out of Britain. And they all, of all the people that uh, they, they surveyed, um, I think it was nearly like 40,000 young people, and um, of all their time and the different social media networks that were out there, there were two really interesting observations. One of the biggest fears that the young people have in the UK and Britain in that area is what is called FOMO. Now, there's a new one for you. It's the fear of missing out. And so we have young people that are plugged in, not this way, but their, their phones are constantly on a charger 24 hours a day, no matter where they go, for fear of missing out. It is an anxiety complex. Can you imagine that? In all the forms of communication we have, we develop an anxiety that we might miss out on what is happening in the world. That is what I mean when I talk about a thinly veiled concept of friendship. That is why when the Bible says it is not good to be alone, we need to explore that and what are the implications behind it. And now we are finding that we not deliberately are choosing to be alone, but we are finding ourselves being isolated. And then when the survey comes around, they call you up. We have 22 questions we'd like for you to answer. You qualify as a lonely person even though you have the largest network of people in your circle of friends. And so, what is the matter? I think the problem is that we go to the second theme, second uh, thread of this text, is that since there's a duty of friendship that is not being satisfied. There's a duty of friendship that, that we are failing to engage ourselves in. And he's going to give it to us in these four areas. Uh, the first is going to be in verse 9, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. So the, in the area of doing things together for productivity or to see a task accomplished, second is going to be found in verse 10, and that is in the area of temptation and sin. For if they fall, will one lift up his fellow, but woe to him that is alone when he falls. The third is going to be the lack of comfort. And if one prevail against another, or excuse me, if two lie together, they have heap, and how can one be warm alone? And then the f uh, fourth one is if an individual prevail, we, friendships help in protecting one another. So you have those four categories, labor, sin, comfort, and temptation, or protection. It could be a, an either or. Now you're saying, listen, I don't see anything about temptation in their labor is the only one that really stands out as being quite evident. But yet, as Solomon and as Jesus would teach, we draw lessons from the illustration. So the illustration is not the lesson. 
the, the illustration, the story, is the basis of a lesson that we can make numerous applications to it. So in a premarital counseling situation, this is an ideal text to talk about uh, two people coming together. You want to be friends for life. And here are the qualifying factors of what it is to be in friendship. So in your marriage, you want to make sure that you do all your work together. You want to make sure that you prevent one another from sin. You want to comfort one another. And you want to be able to face the temptation of the married life together. Two are better than one. And so let's take a look at the first one. I'm not going to spend a lot of time. Most of them are self-explanatory. But there is a mutual benefit of reaping from work. I'll give you an illustration. We had a soccer game here on Friday. We had two soccer games this week, and I went back to my old habit of cooking hamburgers. Went downtown, bought a grill, fired up the grill. The first night, eh, people probably didn't know that we were going to serve up supper, so there weren't but 24 burgers that were sold. Friday night, it was a sellout. 50 hamburgers and about uh, 16 hot dogs. Now, we were in there in the dark, and already my mind is thinking, I'm just going to set up lighting over here. We'll figure something out, but we're going to have a lit up canopy area. We're going to sell dogs and burgers because darkness comes. The team came over, the other team. They supported this big time. One guy bought a hamburger. He went back over and told his friends, like the woman at the well, and they all came over. And there was this parent that helped me do this work. And she was just about all packed up, ready to go, and we saw this white mass of humanity coming at us. And she said, should I stay? I said, yes. <laughs> and she helped serve. But that, here's the point. We worked together. And in that labor of love together, we were able to enjoy and share the joy of the soccer game the sellout crowd, even though we didn't sell one ticket because we don't, but all of the bleachers were filled and all of the hamburgers sold and, and there was just a, a, there was a certain amount of joy and excitement that came with us. And so when we left, it was like this was not a big deal to have to clean up in the dark because we accomplished a task together. We do the same thing when we have any one of our events. You can do the same thing in your home. When both of you work together with something, there is a unity of spirit. We share ideas. We put together trade craft skills, and we come up with sometimes inventions. We come up with things being done faster. We come up with productivity. But two are better than one in our labor together. Secondly, in the area of sin, Galatians 6.1 teaches us this. There's a need for restoration. There will always be a need for restoration in our lives. And so he teaches us, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such one in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest thou also be tempted. So from that, why do we need a friend? Well, for these reasons, number one, we're going to be all subject to deception somewhere, bad judgment calls. A friend is the one that's going to be there, and we look at verse 11, or verse 10, is, and that is this, for if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow, but woe to him that is alone when he falls, for he has not another to help him. So, you, you, uh, uh, you're drawn toward a particular philosophy, an idea, a practice uh, something that is contrary to what you know and you understand very well in the Bible, but yet temptation draws you. And there's going to be a very good possibility that you'll probably be sucked into that, overtaken in a fault. But the one, your friend, is there to help you, the one that is spiritual, the one that is mature. He observes what is happening in your life. He might even be part of the same temptation, but he's there to offer, secondly, restoration. He wants to help you get your life back in order, put you on the right track. And that probably will be why, by way of practical wisdom or wisdom from the Word of God or maybe sitting down and say, you know, we can look at this together in the Scriptures. So that brings the third point, and that is there's the need of a second party. Woe unto him in verse uh, 10 that is alone when he falls, the necessity of someone else beside you, someone that you've deliberately invited into your life. Woe unto you if you deliberately exclude people from your life and you find yourself trying to face the roaring lion whom he seeks to devour by yourself. 
You're not going to be able to stand up. Your situation will only get worse. The intention of what the teacher is telling us today, maintain good friendship. Look for people that will be there in your labor. Look for somebody that will be there because there will be those occasions when you need restoration. There may be a time when you must help him be restored. Mutual friendship. So it's not a friendship based on selfishness. It's a friendship that is based on mutual care and concern. Then, and then our first observation from this 6-1 is that, that all of us, are subject to temptation and sin. We, we don't stand alone. It's not like it'll never happen. We face it every day through the media, through peer pressure, through culture, through our work environment. Uh, it, it just comes at you. We're constantly being bombarded by all of this. So that is the duty of friendship, the mutual benefit of reaping in our labor together. Secondly, the, the, the need for restoration, mutual friendship to protect each other's soul. And then thirdly, the, the benefit of caring compassion. You'll notice in verse 11 it tells us this. Again, if two lie together and they have not heat, how can one be warm alone? Do you ever have a sense of loneliness? And people will describe it this way. I just feel so cold and lonely. If you were stranded in, um, in, in a mountain terrain in a, a blizzard snowstorm and you're by yourself and you realize that if no one comes to find you, you very well could freeze to death. You're going to be cold in two senses. One, physically, because the body temperature and the air temperature is going to slowly decrease. And secondly, there will be that sense of loneliness. I don't want to die alone. But if there is another there, when two people, if you will, die together, there is a, uh, someone there, there's that comfort, there's that companionship. That Listen, somebody's going to show up. We can be sure about it. And those things are realities they actually have. The prisoners of war depended on each other very, very much because they were going through the same struggle. And one would help to lift up the other, even at the risk of his own life during the, for example, in the uh, death march in Bataan by the Japanese. So the benefit of caring compassion toward one another, how can one be warm alone? It is a rhetorical question. If you've ever had a situation, physically speaking, where you were outdoors and you were uh, sleeping and the, the cold night air comes on your face and penetrates your tent and your blanket, it's, it's just not good. But if your spouse is there with you, and it's a family setting, you're all together, there's, there's a warmth that comes through body heat. That is the foundation of the lesson. The real lesson is this, that Solomon would uh, help us to understand, there is comfort. There is someone there that's going to demonstrate compassion, because that kind of compassion gives a warm, friendly feel. Remember the five senses when you show compassion by a praying and holding a hand, there's the transmission of warmth as well that identifies with the tenderness that is there. Now, us northerners, we need to get over that, but I know you people down here, you love this huggy stuff, you know. We rewrote the, the brotherly hug kiss thing, you know. We, we came up with a different rendition of it. But the truth of the matter is there's a lot of merit behind that physical contact that expresses compassion and mercy and tenderness. How can one be alone and stay warm? You need, we need somebody like that in our lives. Third, the last lesson that we find in the duty of friendship is the benefit of mutual watchfulness. Remember the roaring lion that Peter talks about in chapter 5 and verse 8? Where he says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. Now, we have the armor that is given to us in Ephesians chapter 6. But if you look carefully at that list of armor that we put on from the helmet, the shield, the sword, and the, the shoes, and the breastplate of righteousness, and all, all of those things, nothing is there to protect your back. That's what a friend is for. He watches your back. And so what we find is, is in verse 12, and if one prevail against him, two shall withstand. In other words, sneak attack. There may be things happening in your life that you're, you're not aware of, and it comes in through the back door, as we say. And it affects your soul, it affects your heart. 
A friend is there for mutual watchfulness. In that day, when you journeyed from one village to another, it was not always the safest. They didn't have city street lights. There were no state troopers on the path. There were only you and the bad guys, and not to mention the wildlife. So uh, the lion, when Peter talks about a roaring lion, he also is illustrative of what was common in the culture. And here we have, you're on your journey, and, and uh, there's always the danger of tripping over that rock which you cannot see. The train was not all level like it is in Florida. Then there would be the danger of you might be a victim like the uh, individual that was robbed and beaten along the road in the story of the Good Samaritan. Those, that was a common event. There's a lot of people did not travel at night and those that would risk their lives doing it were subject to some kind of attack. But having a friend with you is like having four eyes. It's like being a mom. You have eyes in the front, you have eyes in the back. I love the commercial where the, the lady's telling the kids, be still. And the, how does she, moms have eyes behind your head. You see the little girl looking to see. Is that really true? Well, the whole idea of that, that illustration and what we're talking about here is somebody else can be watching after you. And we need that because we can tend to leave our guard down. We cannot see 360 degrees. We're not aware of the many various ways of the deceptiveness, the angel of light to the roaring lion, how he's going to come in. But we do need that friend. And the duty of friendship is to be able to protect somebody from being blindsided by an attack and deception of our adversary. So with that leads us to the third theme that was given to us, and that is this, the prevailing strength of friendship. There is an enormous amount of power and strength when we have good quality friends. I'm going to qualify this. We're not talking about just anybody. So tonight's sermon talks about the characteristics of a good friend and of being a good friend. But when we, for the purpose of our text, Solomon's drawing it together, and he, and he simply put the major theme, the major point that he's trying to make is this, it is not good to be alone. However, when there are two, it is like the threefold cord that is not quickly broken. An illustration that would demonstrate the cord that we use to drop a well, bucket into the well, or the cord that we use to hold a lamp in place as it would be suspended from the ceiling and so that it wouldn't drop and break and spill oil and fire all over the place. That of, of uh, the three ropes weaved together for the purpose of pulling, weight, logs, what have you, construction. They understood that. We had to explain it. I would have to take you to a hardware store and show you. Now, here's a three-fold cord, and, there's, and, and it's measured in the amount of weight that it can lift or hold or suspend. And, it, and so rope is sold by weight classification. That's our modern technological day. For the people of that day, a three cord, a cord that is uh, uh, woven together has integrity, it has strength, and that is the value of having quality friendship. That it is something that you can prevail over the many dimensions of life that are going to prove to be testing and trying. It will prevail in moments of temptation. So the, the mutual accountability and the bonding of friendship is a prevailing over labor and getting a task accomplished without being discouraged. It helps us when we, there are those occasions whereby we are discouraged and worn out and sick or maybe dying or whatever it might be. And we need the words of comfort, the prevailing effect of two being able to comfort one another. And then there's the attack of the enemy. So his primary point is this. Friendships are so valuable. Do not mis dis dismiss the idea. Do not take it lightly. And I would strongly urge you that you consider that the friendship that we can find in Jesus Christ 
he meets all of these qualifications. There's not a friend we have in Jesus, no, not one. He was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us come boldly before the throne of grace, where right we can find grace and mercy to help, mercy and grace to help in our time of need. Jesus uh, struggled the same way that we did, but then he also tells us in Hebrews that he now therefore is gladly calling us his friends. Jesus identifies with sinners as a friend. He died on the cross. He laid out his life for us who were not his friends. And by virtue of that and faith in Jesus Christ, you become that close friend to Jesus. Now, that's just another name given for Jesus in terms of his relationship to humanity. It's not limited to that. But if, as we look at this text today, we draw that lesson out of it, the expression of friendship. And you want to talk about prevailing friendship? Nobody else is going to give you the, the strength of prevalence as what Jesus does 24 hours a day. Help you battle temptation, help you to have comfort, help you to be uh, able to uh, resist the devil, to labor and get work done by virtue of the close proximity of Christ in your life. So I challenge you today, and as we actually will have some more challenging thoughts this evening, but if you're here today, think about this. Number one, your relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ. That is first. That is, that is the basis, the foundation of friendship, just like our love for God is the foundation for our love for our neighbor, for our spouse and our families. So that, that, that's where it really begins in the Christian community. And by the way, as we move from that, friendship is not limited to just the Christian community. Believers can be the strongest asset in a non-believer's life in what comes in terms of friendship. I understand what the Bible says about not being not unequally yoked, but the Bible also teaches us that because we exist in this world, we must show ourselves to be friendly for the purpose of being that qualifying, definitive friend that will help them in times of need of comfort, facing trials, working together, and being that, uh, that individual that is there when they go through a struggle and where two are better than one. The prevailing strength of friendship, it lends itself to identity with Christ through your life as individuals. Who are your friends? Now remember the survey. The Vervet survey pointed out that 43.5% of, of, the, of the population of those that were surveyed feel lonely. If you're one of those that has a sense of loneliness, the only thing that you can do is you look at a biblical worldview of friendship and you go to the Bible and you say, then what is it to be a friend? Why do I feel lonely? Maybe I am not part of the two better than one. Maybe I fall by myself or I'm not there to help someone li get lifted up. Maybe someone needs comfort and I need comfort, but I'm neither nor. I don't do either one of those. And then there is a situation of working together. I just choose to do things on my own all the time. It is not good. It is not good. And so it's best for the church, it's best for the individual to engage in wholehearted, practical, soul-strengthening friendship with one another. It begins with the friendship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray together. Our Father, we do thank you that in our time together, as we study the Word of God, and we look at that song that talks about the friendship of Jesus, number 422. We ask that even as we sing the hymn that we would be able to translate that to our own lives and share that same love and care with one another. So help us, our God. Thank you for the teacher's words. Thank you for the lessons that he gives and the impact that it can have on our lives, our culture, our church. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.